Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This mass of tubes, wires and plumbing is at the heart of the ArcJet facility at NASA Ames. This is what's needed to inject 60 megawatts of power into compressed, fast-moving air so that it ionizes and ejects out a nozzle at hypersonic speeds for testing heat shield materials. This facility has been around since the 1960s. It's worked on Apollo, Space Shuttle, many planetary probes, and even the heat shield of Dragon and Orion. So I got to visit this as part of a tour which involved myself and oh, a whole bunch of other people that were at the open source event in San Francisco. A bunch of space nerds formed a splinter group, including this guy. So we were specifically checking out the Interaction Heating Facility, which is just one of the parts of the Ames ArcJet complex, which has a bunch of common systems that support various specialized experimental systems between two buildings. And elsewhere around NASA Ames, there's also things like shock tube facilities and hypersonic gun ranges, which can also do similar testing. So this facility essentially operates like a wind tunnel. You have high pressure air being forced in at one end, it's forced through a nozzle to control its speed, and then after interacting with the models, the air escapes through a low pressure section. But the big difference is they massively heat and ionize the air. And this gets a pretty good approximation of the conditions on re-entry. The difference is that on re-entry you've essentially got cold air and the spacecraft is pummeling into it hard enough to turn the gas into a plasma. The wind tunnel simply isn't throwing the gas at it fast enough, so it has to heat the gas up ahead of time instead. It is possible to achieve re-entry style velocities in wind tunnels, but these tend to be very short-lived tests. So the ArcJet can maintain these kind of testing conditions for a sustained amount of time, as long as they just keep pumping in megawatts of electricity to heat this plasma. So here's a diagram showing a cross-section of the main heating unit. This is the ArcJet, and it's called an ArcJet because it's basically creating an electrical arc between two points, and that is heating the gas to a plasma. So at the left side you have the upstream electrode package and at the right side you have the downstream electrode package and the lightning bolt is basically flowing down the middle. The air for the test is flowed in through the side through that constrictor section where it's heated and as it expands it wants to escape and it will go down sideways through that nozzle into the experimental chamber. So now looking back at this, the white lines, those are all carrying water for cooling. Everything else is carrying a gas. So those orange lines, they connect to this large manifold and I'm presuming this is test gas. It's either air or nitrogen. There's two of these big pipes and on the other side, the pipe, the lines are a different color. Now at the back, there's also these green lines. I think those carry argon. And finally, I think they're striped power cables, but it blows my mind that this is a wind tunnel and most of the test gas is coming in through these tiny pipes. So most of the interior of this is made of high quality copper with cooling channels integrated into it. This is one of many electrode discs which are stacked at each end of the tube. But since you're pumping 60 megawatts through this system, things get damaged and these rings erode. And this is one example they brought out showing a burn through on it. And in the background, you can see the fully assembled unit with all this stuff, you know, the lines connecting out of it. And that object on the right with the, like, the, the semi-lenticular shape, I guess, right? It's a semi-elliptical shape. That's actually part of a nozzle. And you have regular circular nozzle designs and you have these semi-elliptical designs depending upon what kind of target you're aiming the stuff at. And in addition to there being two different shapes of nozzles, you can have many different size of nozzles and each of these will provide different exhaust velocities and therefore energy densities for your targets. So there's another thing that's sort of important here in that you've got this very powerful electrical arc that's shooting down the middle here and where it's contacting the surface, it's going to erode. And as I understand it, this particular design incorporates coils that generate magnetic fields that move and they're essentially constantly rotating their magnetic fields so that touching point for the electron or for the arc is moving constantly and therefore not eroding one bit continuously. There's apparently another type of uh, arc jet system which is called a Hules type and what happens is the air goes in and rotates, it causes a vortex in there and that tends to keep the electric arc in the middle and it also means the points where it does touch the side, those are constantly moving around. And so all this makes for very, very hot plasma, something like 8,000 Fahrenheit, over 4,000 Celsius, and it will attack all sorts of stuff 
very, very quickly. It's not just that you want to make it hot, you also want to disassociate it into it, atomic oxygen, atomic nitrogen, because that's the environment that heat shields are dealing with. So this insanely hot plasma blows through essentially a rocket nozzle and into a test chamber. This is obviously evacuated normally, and there are these big optically perfect windows so that you can actually put uh, you know, instruments through it. Of course, this is a tour, and what tourists wouldn't want to go into the vacuum chamber where so many thermal protection systems have met their end at the hands of plasma. The chamber is something like three meters by three meters. It is pretty small. They could take a few people in at a time, but yeah, wow, uh, it was... It was very cool to be inside here and of course the first thing I wanted to do was take my camera and stick it down this uh, extractor nozzle. So that's the nozzle there that the plasma comes out of and this is the vent that it disappears down and that little square thing down there, that is a gate valve that stops the vacuum on the other side from sucking the air out of the chamber. You'll also notice that this arm, right? So these are stings, they call them. These are the things which carry the material sample. And when the flow is running, they will rotate it into place so that it can be absorbed. And you'll see that it's, it's covered in pipes to keep it cool. This is a nozzle here. There's, sorry, this extractor. It's also covered in this you know, water uh, piping to keep the thing cool during this whole operation. You might also notice these sample holding arms, they are actually hollow because you can run cables up the middle to carry data from the samples as they're being tested. So this exhaust capture system, it leads to the vacuum system which is running through the wall. It's actually shared between multiple of these tunnels. It uses steam to blow, you know, high pressure steam through the system and keep sucking things through and make sure that a vacuum can be maintained inside this chamber for a very long time. Now you might have noticed that on the other side of that cab there was another window and instead of actually looking pointing sensors in there they actually use that to shoot lasers into the system. You see wh while this is running at full power 60 megawatts that's a lot it's only really able to get somewhat close to the orbital performance. If you have a spacecraft returning from the moon, then the extra speed generates this plasma layer uh, you know, just off the surface. And that, uh, instead of the plasma flowing onto the surface and transferring heat directly, it's so hot that it starts emitting thermal radiation and most of the energy at returning from the moon speeds is actually photons coming from this stagnation plasma and heating the surface via that. So they have another room where they just set up lasers to shoot at it. So for this facility they have four lasers. They are each fiber lasers that generate 50 kilowatts. They uh, generate light at 1070 nanometers, so that is below the you know, range of human visibility, but of course they will still happily burn your eye out. This optical table is what they use to calibrate or you know, to focus and adjust the light pattern because depending upon what you want to do with the target, you might want a narrow focused area to maximize the amount of your radiation that's going into it, or you might want a wider area because you want something that's perhaps lower temperature but uh, you want a, a larger you know, scale test. So yeah, of course, they brought out this little sample showing that if you concentrate it down into like a two, one or two inch square, then yes, 200 kilowatts of laser power is quite capable of slicing its way through sheets of metal. And you know, when I say sheet, I mean half inch thick piece of solid, very solid steel. So this facility is called LEAF, it's the Laser Enhanced Arc Jet Facility. It's not needed, but when they do use it, they have the laser sitting in a completely different area and the light is actually transferred in via fiber optics, which are of course have, you know, if the fiber optics break, the laser shut down within microseconds because that would be a very bad day. The control room is very much from decades past with that a classic shade of sea green that they would put on nuclear missile consoles to make people feel calm about ending the world. That design language has very clearly been passed on to those people in charge of a giant plasma cutter. Sadly, we didn't get to push any buttons, but we did get a show of ArcJet Facility's greatest hits. 
so we could see the stings moving the samples into position. Now, I recognise which one this was. I was standing next to that earlier. And as you watch this, you can see why they have to actively cool these things to protect against the fury of that plasma. Now, again, those stings, they can carry you know, wiring for sensors, but we really only saw the video, including this uh, rather nice super slow-mo of a meteorite disintegrating. So this is at 1,500 frames per second. That's 50 times slower than normal. And what you can see is the heat melting this meteoritic material, and it's the droplets are sort of getting caught in the, the wake behind the tip of this thing. If you know like blunt bodies, you'll you'll know that you get these vortexes forming, and that's vortexes of air that we've seen. This is a vortex of lava trapped in the leeward side, and that's the kind of thing you can do with a plasma wind tunnel. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.